Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Collins. I am the Director of Point of Care Global Marketing for Siemens Healthcare, and I will be the moderator for this webinar. Siemens is pleased to be part of the fifth annual Clinical Diagnostics and Research online conference. Our speaker today is Dr. Monet Sayag, who will be presenting on the role of lactate in the assessment of morbidity and mortality. Sepsis, including severe sepsis and septic shock, are common today and are associated with substantial mortality and the consumption of significant healthcare resources. It is estimated that 18 million cases of sepsis are reported each year worldwide. This is a very important issue that hospitals deal with every day. I'm sure you'll find the presentation most interesting. Our speaker today is Dr. Monet Sayag. Dr. Sayag is a senior medical and clinical consultant for Siemens Healthcare Diagnostics. He received his Bachelor of Science in Biology and Chemistry from the University of Mobile in Mobile, Alabama. He has a Bachelor of Medical Technology from Anderson Memorial Hospital School of Medical Technology in Anderson, South Carolina. He also has a Master of Science in Health Sciences from the American University School of Graduate Studies in Coral Gables, Florida. And finally, Dr. Sayag earned his Doctor of Medicine degree also at the American University School of Medicine in Coral Gables. His postgraduate training is in the area of general surgery with emphasis on emergency non-trauma, minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery from the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Sayeg has 25 years of experience in the fields of medicine, research, surgery, and clinical laboratory science. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Monet Sayeg. Thank you, uh, uh, Kevin, and uh, welcome all of you to this educational webinar. Um, Lactate has been uh, around for quite some time. Uh, however, its value in risk uh, stratifying a number of disease states is still expanding. Uh, it was first discovered in the 18th uh, century when it was isolated from sour milk. In the early 60s, uh, Huckabee wrote one of the earlier papers on the significance of hyperlactatemia in hospitalized patients. And the body of evidence supporting uh, the value of lactate measurements have been uh, grown ever uh, since. In a normal steady state with adequate tissue resources and oxygenation, their more cellular energy can be extracted aerobically by means of the citric acid cycle and the electronic transport chain. In this case, cells convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA through oxidative decarboxylation. When the body experiences inadequate tissue perfusion, it undergoes anaerobic metabolism to create some energy, even in small amounts. In this case, pyruvate metabolizes to lactate ultimately generate fewer ATPs, normally 2 versus 36 ATPs, than though the normal uh, aerobic mechanism. Let's keep in mind that even under normal conditions, this process occurs to some degree. However, lactate in normal human subjects clear very quickly at a rate of up to about 320 millimoles per liter per hour, mostly by liver metabolism and reconversion of lactate back to pyruvate. Lactate uh, production occurs in all tissues, namely skeletal muscles, brain, red blood cells, and kidneys. The systemic imbalance between oxygen delivery and demand caused lactate levels to sharply rise, both in experimental and clinical conditions. Lactate levels are long been used to reflect the presence of tissue hypoxia, and hypoxia results in cell death 
and it's not resolved, lead to organ failure and ultimately death. But rather than thinking lactate solely as a byproduct of an inadequate blood perfusion, it may be useful to consider lactate as a marker of strained cellular metabolism. Patients with sepsis, trauma, volume depletion, blood loss, septic shock, and systemic inflammatory syndrome can have altered lactate levels. While lactate is a very nonspecific marker, knowing lactate levels, particularly early in patients presenting, uh, early in patients' presentation, can uh, uh, valuable uh, can give us or provide us uh, valuable information to help guide patient assessment and, and treatment. The uh, College of Emergency Medicine has developed a quick user's guide to uh, help physicians understand lactate values. While there are limitations to its use, lactate levels should be used in the ED as a diagnostic guide in septic patients. If above normal levels, there is, there is cause for concern. Lactate values are essential in identifying tissue hypoperfusion in patients who are not yet hypotensive but at risk for septic shock. Also, a raised lactate level, especially in the rate of clearance, when we look at the rate of clearance, has a prognostic value for survival. Uh, as the user's guide from the College of Emergency Medicine notes, normal levels of lactate in healthy subjects range from somewhere between 0 to 2 millimoles per liter. A lactate level greater than 2 millimoles per liter is a cause for concern, and if sepsis criteria are already met, this indicates severe uh, sepsis. And as Nigen in this uh, paper noted, blood lactate concentrations greater than 4 millimoles per liter are unusual in normal and not critically ill hospitalized patients. Regardless of their underlying comorbidities, this may be indicating septic shock if the patient does not respond to fluid. Now, repeating the levels provides a clinical uh, picture of the patient's ability to clear lactate. After initial resuscitation using oxygen, fluids, swabs and cultures, antibiotics, blood tests, and urinary catheter of hourly assessment of urinary output, the greater the level of clearance, the better. However, as the College of Emergency Medicine's user guide notes, if the blood pressure remains low, normally the systolic blood pressure is less than 90, and the mean arterial pressure is less than 65. This is definite septic shock regardless of the uh, lactate level. Well, this is a too familiar of, of a slide. Clinician normally caring for patients in the hospital or ED setting, they face many challenges. The presentations of symptom can be confusing. In addition, the progress of disease can be so rapid, pathology so severe, that it is often recognized late, eliminating the critical window of, uh, for early intervention when treatment is most likely to be successful. It is all too often when healthcare providers have to tell a family member that their loved one who had appeared relatively well or on the road to recovery perhaps only the day before that their condition has suddenly worsened. That patient may be in critical condition in the ICU or even have died. So strategies to minimize that scenario are of paramount importance. Lactic acidosis is frequently seen in the critically ill patients. 
despite a large number of potential etiologies, tissue hypoperfusion is by far the most common etiology among the critically ill patients. Aggressive cardiorespiratory resuscitation designed, or designed to restore tissue perfusion is the fundamental approach of these patients. So by monitoring blood lactate concentration, it allows for some prognostication and indicates when supportive therapies are restoring perfusion. Here are listed the different types uh, that are listed. Uh, for example, type A results from an imbalance between tissue oxygen supply and demand. There are lactic acidosis under type B. Uh, lactic acidosis occurring when clinical evidence of poor tissue perfusion or oxygenation is absent. Uh, it is important to know that, uh, as we all know, lactate measurements may be helpful in the emergency department, the OR, and in the ICU. Now, uh, the concentration uh, or the concentrations of lactate and hydrogen ions in maternal and fetal blood indicates their movement is from fetus to mother and can move in either direction. So therefore, maternal acidosis will be reflected in the fetus. Therefore, during pregnancy, for example, the umbilical artery lactate concentration, the acid-base balance can help predict perinatal outcomes with similar efficacy. However, its simplicity makes lactate analysis an interesting alternate, alternative in obstetric uh, care. In addition, infants born following prolonged or complicated labors during which oxygen supply to the fetus is likely to be the impaired, to be impaired and are more uh, acidotic and have significantly higher lactate levels. So in the ICU, the concentration of lactate is an index of clinical condition of the infant. Raised lactate levels were associated with increased mortality in ventilated babies. A clinically important increases in blood lactate may precede the development of clinical markers of deterioration and complication. Also, blood lactate concentrations may provide an early warning signal and important prognostic information in the ill ventilated neonate. Serial measurement of blood lactate following open heart surgery in pediatric patients have become a part of a routine monitoring. In some hospitals, physicians use measurements of blood lactate to guide therapy by cardiotropic support, volume support, and or blood pressure regulation as suggested by the Felidi in this paper. The initial lactate measurements after surgery indicate that the magnitude of oxygen death incurred during surgery a post-op lactate of 6 millimoles per liter or above generally indicates that the patient will require a higher level of support. Also, a definite rise in lactate of any time warrants rapid therapeutic intervention by means of volume support, inotropic agents, vasodilators, or ventilatory support. Also, during the initial 24 hours following surgery, blood lactate levels should steadily decline and by 24 hours should be at or near normal range. So among the criteria used to initiate ECMO, the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, are hypoxemia that fails to respond to conventional ventilatory support and bar trauma. In all cases, the infant must have a reversible disorder and be at the greatest risk for dying. Also, an additional criteria that has been proven to be of use in blood lactate, which may be used as a final 
decision point to determine whether an infant is put on ECMO or not. The uh, institutions, or various institutions, uh, when, when it comes to lactate measured before initiation of ECMO, that is less than five millimoles, uh, and, and uh, declining, that's usually where they suggest ECMO uh, may be unnecessary. But at lab lactate above five millimoles per liter, it supports the decision to go to the ECMO and lactate is then measured early in ECMO procedure, usually less than one hour, uh, then every four to six hours as uh, warranted. In uh, the normal intensive care and uh, the normal intensive patients, uh, when they are admitted to the hospital with lactate level of four or higher, they face uh, an in-hospital mortality close to about 40 to 50 percent because the patient's blood pressure may be relatively, uh, relatively normal, uh, and these patients, at least initially, it is important to look for metabolic evidence of tissue hypoperfusion, and measuring lactate is a relatively effective way to do that. If we uh, look at researchers uh, and papers, uh, they are looked that uh, uh, aggressively, these patients must be treated and uh, who had a normal blood pressure, but an elevated lactate, the group's mortality rate was 16% lower than the control group. Uh, their Apache score were also considerably uh, lower. So patients admitted to the ED with clinically suspected infection, those with normal blood pressure, Increased blood lactate level greater than four millimoles per liter were associated with a 10 times higher mortality rate than normal lactate levels, uh, mortality around uh, 26 or 27 percent. Early recognition of trauma patients at risk for developing infectious uh, complications is a very difficult task. Diagnosis of infection can be troublesome. A positive bacteri uh, bacteriological specimen may be late or absent. The clinical interpretation of local colonization may be ambiguous. Traditional infection makes such a core body temperature, and the WBC may show nonspecific alterations. Because admission lactate level measurements have been shown to correlate with fatal outcome and organ failure in trauma patients. In this paper, the author tested the theory that initial lactate level could help differentiate between patients with eventual septic cores and those without it. Bittler et al. and this paper confirmed that initial lactate levels help differentiate patients with an eventual septic course versus those without it. They also determined that changes in lactate values over the first 24 hours provided a tool to identify patients at risk for developing an infection, sepsis, and death. Failed or insufficient lactate clearance usually less than 2.5 or always below 2.5 um, millimoles per liter in this paper, within 24 hours is associated with longer hospital stay and ICU stay and uh, increased duration of mechanical ventilation. Okay, why I'm showing you uh, this picture. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Uh, Tim Buckman as a as a known uh, professor of surgery at Emory University, uh, indeed um, described uh, this microbe or the response of what we refer to it as the cytokine storm. Uh, there is an interesting book uh, by Sir William Osler, a, a Canadian uh, pathologist, educator, and a historian, uh, wrote this book, uh, The Evolution of Modern Medicine, 
describing uh, the cytokine storm uh, and eventually uh, that is initiated by either infectious or non-infectious agent that led to sepsis, uh, septic, sh septic shock, and ultimately death. And uh, <clears throat> the basic mechanisms uh, of, of the septic process, uh, it's very heterogeneic. Uh, it was believed that sepsis was an exaggerated hyperinflammatory response with patients dying uh, from inflammation, uh, induced lung injury. More recently, findings indicate that significant heterogeneity exists in the inflammatory responses of septic patients. At this point, the literature clearly illustrates that no single mediator system pathway or even pathogen drives, uh, drives the pathophysiology of sepsis. So the basic mechanisms of septic process are multifactorial. There are the, the dysregulation, uh, coagulation, altered hemostasis, prolonged clotting times. Uh, there's certainly aberrant mediator production, hyperinflammatory, blunted inflammatory response, and unknown inflammatory response. Cellular dysfunction, uh, many cellular aspects become dysfunctional in sepsis uh, and may be characterized as either excessive activation or depressed function. There are metabolic alteration. These alterations, uh, patients usually who are critically ill exhibit insulin resistant and hyperglycemia, a condition known as the diabetes of stress but it is controversial. There are issues with hypoglycemia as well as the costs associated with this close, with close monitoring. Also, low-dose steroid uh, versus high-dose uh, glucosteroids have not shown an improvement in outcome and have been associated with an increased risk of death. So evidence does exist that some patients with sepsis have adrenal failure and these patients benefit from replacement doses of glucocorticoids administered over a prolonged uh, period of time. But the early goal directed therapy, uh, as was demonstrated by Rivers et al., that early administration of fluid and blood product uh, significantly improves survival of sepsis patients or septic patients in the emergency department. Uh, let's look at lactate in surgery patients. So the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, as we refer to it, uh, SIRS, is common in the post-op period of, uh, of uh, the critically ill patients. So uh, Sir Kelly uh, et al. In, this, uh, uh, in his investigation, uh, he correlated between lactate levels multiple organ uh, dysfunction and mortality in patients with SIRS. Uh, using uh, the cutoff of two uh, millimoles per liter at the inclusion of the study, the relative risk uh, of death in seven days was around 4.23, four, uh, and at 28 days was uh, 1.7. And uh, the uh, LE, which is the uh, uh, lactate elevated, uh, using a cutoff uh, uh, or using the cutoff of greater than two millimoles per liter, uh, had a seven-day mortality rate of approximately 39%, which is significantly greater than uh, for patients with normal value of lactate, those mortality was around 9%. Uh, the 28-day mortality was uh, 46 percent in the LE group and 20 percent in the normal lactate level less than two milliliters per liter. So lactate in severe sepsis uh, uh, described by Arnold et al. Uh, he wanted to determine in this paper if early lactate clearance 
is associated with improved survival in the emergency department uh, in those uh, with severe sepsis. And the concordance between central venous oxygen saturation uh, optimization and lactate clearance during early sepsis resuscitation. As you can see, while lactate non-clearance occurred in only 15 of the 166 patients, approximately 9%, the author uh, found that early lactate clearance was a strong predictor of in-hospital death. The cause of an elevated serum lactate in patients with sepsis can be multifactorial. Uh, although lactate elevation may result from acute tissue hypoperfusion and uh, anaerobic metabolism, other possible causes may include uh, sepsis-induced impairment of the pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme activity. There are also uh, increased lactate production via catecholamine-driven pathways or decreased lactate clearance due to hepatic dysfunction. However, regardless of the etiology, as you can see, an elevated serum lactate or lactate elevation in sepsis has been consistently linked to increased mortality. 111 patients were enrolled uh, with a mean age of about 65 years of age uh, in the emergency department. The length of stay was somewhere between six to nine days, and an overall in-hospital mortality rate was around 42%. The uh, baseline Apache score was about 20, and lactate was about 6.9 plus or minus 4.6. This uh, study uh, by Nigan again, uh, uh, looked at uh, 111 patients um, in the emergency department. So why I'm showing you this, uh, this is a formula for lactate uh, clearance, very much used uh, all over the country uh, and, and worldwide. Uh, lactate clearance, or the percent, was defined using this formula uh, at the AD uh, presentation, normally you know at zero hour, when patients pre uh, present to the emergency department, so minus lactate at uh, hour six uh, divided by lactate at the ED presentation, they multiply by 100. So you have basically lactate levels at presentation, and you minus that from uh, uh, you know six hours later of the level divided uh, by the uh, uh, the lactate level at presentation times 100. So a positive value denotes a decrease or clearance of lactate. It's good. A negative value denotes an increase in lactate after six hours of ED intervention. That's not good. Now, survivors compared with non-survivors had a lactate clearance of 38% uh, versus 12% uh, respectively. There was an approximately 11% decrease in the likelihood of mortality for each 10% increase in lactate clearance. And uh, interestingly, in this study, uh, Nagin saw and compared other variables such as platelet count, prothrombin time, albumin, bilirubin, and only lactate clearance showed a significant difference between survivors and non-survivors. The high lactate clearance group has a 52% relatively lower in hospital mortality rate compared with the low clearance group, and this mortality difference was similarly observed up to about uh, 60 days. So let's look at uh, you know, circulatory shock and some of the common types of circulatory shock. They are hypovolemic shock due to dehydration, fluid loss, or blood loss. The body uh, initially uh, responds by vasoconstriction to maintain adequate blood pressure. A cardio uh, cardiogenic shock due to decreased cardiac output 
from a variety of causes, the response to this vasoconstriction of the arterial circuit and pooling of blood in the venous uh, circuit. Uh, on the other hand, septic shock characterized by both early and late stages. It's important to focus uh, on those two stages. The early stage, usually, the cardiac output is increased and shunting of the blood from the arterial to the venous circulation. Uh, this may uh, result from a bacterial endotoxins that causes vasodilation in some areas and vasoconstrictions in others. Also, there are serious problems occur if the areas with decreased blood flow are organs with a high oxygen demand such as the brain, kidney, and liver. On the other hand, late septic shock is characterized by decreased cardiac output, vasoconstriction, and edema. So patients seldom recover from the advanced stages of sepsis. So really the whole idea is we hopefully try to avoid that late septic shock at all possible costs. It is important to detect any of these shock states early so that the therapy can be most effective. In uh, this paper, Baker et al. concluded that blood lactate reliability indicated that the effectiveness of therapy in either oxygen, uh, deoxygen, B oxygen, were related to uh, blood lactate. Uh, also, there were documentation that only 11% of patients with expressed or excess lactate concentration, that is greater than uh, 4 millimoles per liter, survived circulatory shock. Uh, others demonstrated that uh, as lactate increases from 2 to 8 millimoles per liter, the estimated probability of survivor decreased from 90% to uh, 10%. Kevin uh, went through some of the stats uh, around the country uh, and also certainly worldwide uh, there are uh, rather alarming numbers, uh, 18 million cases of sepsis a year, 750,000 in the U.S. with severe sepsis cases per year. Uh, the mortality in the U.S. for severe sepsis is somewhere around 38%. Uh, the U.S. severe sepsis uh, costs around $17 billion a year, and uh, uh, hospitalization uh, contribute approximately 2% for sepsis. The rate of severe sepsis hospitalization have doubled in the last decade, uh, the incidence of increase has increased by 1.5 percent per year as a result of several uh, contributing factors that I'll mention, the medical and technological advances associated with treatments, you know, IV, catheters, and so forth, uh, the increasing number of elderly or debilitated people or patients. Uh, with underlying uh, diseases such as cancer who require therapy, and also the widespread use uh, of antibiotics, which encourages the growth of drug-resistant microorganisms. All of these uh, contribute to this uh, high increase uh, uh, incidence of, of uh, sepsis. So who is at risk? You know, we don't think, uh, you know, uh, that uh, the healthy uh, is, is immune uh, from that. Uh, really, there are several risk groups uh, listed here, including those uh, uh, that are shown. Uh, with all uh, at risk, we're all at risk for, for early uh, sepsis, or, or we are certainly uh, uh, even the healthy and the previously healthy are subject to these uh, uh, massive uh, SIRS and, and ultimately sepsis. And so uh, it is important to keep in mind that uh, the uh, statistics uh, that we see three cases per 1,000 of total population, that's just to put it in perspective. The risks rise with age and the incidence is increased as the population ages. 
So 55% of septic patients have a significant comorbidities. Um, there's some data estimated that 12% are COPDs, uh, another 12% non-metastatic uh, neoplasm, 6% patients so with HIV, about 5% uh, of metastatic neoplasm, and 43% uh, mortality associated with sepsis and metastatic uh, neoplasm. So the annual estimated U.S. death, uh, putting it in uh, a perspective, uh, uh, let's look at the severe sepsis alone. Their severe sepsis alone kills more people annually in the U.S. than lung, colon, breast cancer, and stroke. This data uh, uh, shows a 28-day uh, mortality uh, in, in an Italian study of the ICU uh, patients. Uh, mortality risk increases from SIRS to septic shock, uh, 27%. And as we move to the right, uh, sepsis at around 36% mortality. In severe sepsis, closer to about 52% uh, mortality rate, and in septic shock, it approached, uh, reached about 82% mortality. These numbers uh, vary depending on the study, but the trend is very consistent. You know, studies have shown uh, very similar results, but yet uh, you can see as we advanced from SERS to septic shock, the mortality rate increases. Uh, with septic shock and severe sepsis associated with the highest uh, mortality risks, and the ideal biomarker should be indicative of uh, mortality risk. Let's look at the mortality associated with uh, septic shock more closely. The vertical axis plots the odds ratio for death, and the horizontal uh, axis plots time to therapy. As shown in this graph, delaying antimicrobial therapy results in an increasing risk for death. So the shaded area is the 95 percentile confidence interval. Uh, time is the enemy. In a patient with septic shock, the survival rate drops approximately 7.6% every hour. So pathogens are more likely a gram-negative, gram-positive bacteria and fungi. So uh, let's look at a definition of systemic inflammatory response syndrome. How do we define that? SERS is defined as the presence of at least uh, two uh, conditions of the following uh, uh, areas. Uh, two conditions. The defining conditions are white blood cells, respiration, temperature, and heart rate. This definition has been widely criticized because it is very broad. However, it has been a useful uh, uh, for, for clinical study. Now, on the other hand, the definition of sepsis uh, is, is defined as proven to be information co or confirmed or suspected infection. So, it has to be either confirmed or you have suspicion that there is infection in the presence of SIRS. So SIRS uh, must be present. This definition has proven to be useful in practice and, and in different studies. So bacterial infection is the primary culprit, approximately 80% of all cases, with gram-positive uh, being uh, the most common accounts for over 50% uh, of all infections. Um, so uh, the uh, combination of uh, sepsis there must be a confirmed expected uh, uh, sepsis in the presence of SIRS. That's very important. Uh, there are certainly other uh, uh, aerobes, uh, polar microbes and fungi which uh, comprises uh, lesser percentages, but gram-positive, uh, approximately 52.1% uh, of, of the infections uh, for sepsis. 
So, in other words, when we look uh, by far, the uh, sepsis uh, is is uh, confirmed uh, or suspected in the presence of SIRS uh, make up the uh, definition. Again, it's also known that there are non-infectious uh, agents, uh, you know, trauma, burns patient, um, many other conditions that uh, initiate the cascade of events and ultimately leads to sepsis. So there are infectious and non-infectious uh, agents. Okay, now severe sepsis and septic shock definitions uh, are uh, a little different. Uh, since we've now uh, defined sepsis, which is SIRS, and a confirmed or suspected infection, let's define uh, severe sepsis and, and, uh, and septic shock. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, sepsis plus organ dysfunction is severe sepsis. Uh, common dysfunctions occurs in the cardiovascular, renal, respiratory, and hepatic could be hematological or the CNS. Any of these organs can be involved. Uh, severe sepsis, on the other hand, uh, the, uh, uh, there are a hypertension despite adequate fluid resuscitation. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, this is associated with perfusion abnormality, like, for example, oligourea. Now, until a cure for sepsis is found, early detection is the surest hope for survival. Uh, as we've seen in the sepsis literature, the earlier it can be detected and treated, the greater the reduction in mortality and morbidity. So an indicator of morbidity and mortality in sepsis needs to be Rapid because the cascade of events can be rapid with death occurring in about hours, as little as 24 to 72 hours. The early goal directed therapy in septic patients can decrease mortality by as much as 46%. Every hour of delay lowers survival by nearly 8%. And the Global Sepsis Alliance urges the use of antibiotics and intravenous fluids within an hour of suspecting sepsis. Survivors of sepsis are at risk of developing mental and physical impairments late in life. 60% of sepsis patients experience worsening of cognitive or physical functioning or both after their infection. Nearly 17% showed signs of moderate to severe cognitive impairment compared to 6% before the sepsis infection. Also, uh, sepsis contributes to 20,000 new cases of cognitive impairment such as dementia per year. Let's look about a little bit of uh, whole blood versus serum, particularly when you draw blood. Uh, I think it's critical uh, to understand that from a laboratory perspective. So lactate is moderately uh, unstable once it's collected. Uh, as I mentioned very, very early, uh, the earlier slides, that cellular glycolysis can increase lactate, but indeed uh, the, it can increase it by 0. Uh, four millimoles per liter in a whole blood kept at room temperature for 30 minutes. And by about 0 0.1 millimoles per liter, it's kept on ice for 30 minutes. So if blood is preserved with fluoride and oxalate, lactate is much more stable. Lactate increases by no more than 0 0.1 millimoles per liter in a whole blood stored at room temperature for 30 minutes or at four Celsius uh, for eight hours. So sometimes the selections of uh, preservative, you know, anticoagulant uh, tubes is important. Uh, there were no statistically significant difference between the lactate concentrations 
derived from blood samples for healthy, healthy subjects stored in uh, sodium heparin, EDTA, or lithium heparin. So the lactate concentration of blood stored in sodium citrate, however, was lower than that of all other coagulations or co anticoagulants. Uh, when the two samples, uh, one obtained, for example, from sodium heparin, and no anticoagulant uh, were centrifuged at uh, 50 degrees uh, or 10 degrees Celsius uh, for 15 minutes to obtain plasma and serum samples. The plasma and serum lactate were consistently higher than the whole blood values. So again, uh, there is very critical uh, when you measure your lactate to choose the appropriate anticoagulant tube uh, and uh, to make sure that they're not compromised with the results. In patients with a known hyperlactatemia, those who had a concentration greater than 2.2 millimoles per liter, uh, there was a difference of about 0.14 millimoles per liter between plasma and whole blood. There was uh, no difference in plasma or serum samples. So plasma or serum uh, determinations require extra step of centrifugation, which increases technical time, slightly delays reporting of results. Further, the delay in performing the assay also allows for lactate shifts to occur between plasma and blood cell compartments. And for uh, the plasma lactate to increase due to ongoing lactate synthesis by uh, blood cells. So a delay by as much as 30 minutes may increase lactate concentration by as much as 70%. Please keep that in mind. So there have been numerous studies of other markers, and while the added value to the clinical picture, they don't really address the need for early detection of, of sepsis. The use of single measurement uh, of venous lactate that can be available rapidly following admission uh, to the ED provides the clinicians with better risk assessment, possibly with clear direction to diagnosis and therapy than vital signs. The predictive uh, power of lactate levels was, in was independent of uh, blood pressure and uh, covariance. Uh, in about uh, 375 trauma patients admitted to the emergency department, an, an increased lactate level greater than 2 millimoles per liter was a better predictor of morbidity and mort mortality than physiological triage uh, criteria. Uh, this is composed of heart rate, blood pressure, uh, Glasgow coma scale, and respiratory rate. So traditional resuscitation endpoints such as vital signs fail to definitely address the severity of global tissue hypoxia and thus are poor reflection of the resuscitation and the development of organ failure and death. Um, while uh, previous literature may have uh, given the notion that directed care of septic shock patients require invasive uh, measurements such as pulmonary artery pressure, oxygen delivery index, and systemic vascular resistance. Uh, more recent investigations support testing more, ease, uh, more easily acquired in the ED, such as mean arterial blood pressure, central venous pressure, and lactate levels. When the clinical index of suspicion is high uh, that a patient may have or may develop sepsis, time is of the essence. So the need for an accurate and rapid result is paramount and can be achieved with a whole blood sample. Uh, I'm showing you here the, uh, basically the protocol for the early directed uh, therapy in septic shock. Uh, this. Uh, model has been used uh, uh, all over. Uh, the best level of evidence we have for fluid resuscitation in septic shock comes from uh, this early goal-directed therapy trial. 
This is published by uh, Rivers and, and colleagues in 2001. And in this study, uh, there are approximately 263 patients with septic shock or severe sepsis with hypoperfusion. They were identified upon survivor to the emergency department and randomized to receive either standard fluid resuscitation uh, and normalization of the mean arterial blood pressure, uh, central venous pressure, and urine output, or early goal-directed therapy in which the same measurement uh, uh, resuscitation goals were met, but uh, there are additional goals were based upon uh, measurement of the central venous uh, oxygen saturated, as indicated there. Uh, the uh, uh, central venous oxygen saturated, uh, saturation served as a surrogate measure of tissue perfusion and oxygen delivery, and when abnormal in these patients resulted in the transfusion of red blood cells and the administration of ionotropes in an attempt to increase oxygen delivery and tissue perfusion. Uh, all interventions in the study were conducted in the emergency department during the first six hours after survival and uh, uh, diagnosis uh, uh, was, uh, <coughs> was, was done uh, also within that six, uh, after six hours. After that time, uh, patients were transferred to the appropriate intensive care unit or for subsequent hospital care. Um, <clears throat> there are evidence-based uh, guidelines for managing severe sepsis and septic shock that have been shown to improve outcomes. Uh, what is essential is early recognition of sepsis to facilitate early initiation therapy. Uh, obtain cultures, uh, begin intravenous uh, antimicrobial therapy as early as possible uh, within uh, one hour. Uh, initiate uh, uh, an empirical uh, therapy uh, and, and uh, as er, uh, certainly should cover all of the likely pathogens, identify the site of infection, uh, and reassess antimicrobial regimen uh, daily. Uh, <clears throat> there are results from numerous randomized uh, prospective trials uh, that were conducted over the last few years. They're all very similar. Uh, those who uh, apply the uh, protocol for early directed uh, for the uh, early goal directed fluid resuscitation, uh, you can see uh, the sepsis protocol implementation. Uh, uh, there are improvement uh, uh, and decrease the risk of sepsis uh, uh, once that applied. So, in summary. After an exhaustive review of literature, a panel of 55 international experts made several recommendations. Uh, although blood lactate concentration may lack precision as a measure of tissue metabolic status, elevated levels in sepsis support aggressive resuscitation. The surviving uh, sepsis campaign recommends the protocolized resuscitation of patients uh, with sepsis, uh, induced shock, defined as tissue hypoperfusion, that is hypoperfusion uh, persistent after uh, initial fluid uh, challenge or blood lactate concentration greater or equal to 4 millimoles per, uh, per liter. Uh, this protocol should be initiated as soon as hypoperfusion is recognized and should not be delayed pending uh, ICU admission. Based on the recommendation of surviving sepsis campaign and uh, the data we have covered, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement uh, concludes that if serum lactate is not rapidly available in your institution, invest in equipment to make rapid assessment possible. This should be a this should be a standard of care. Uh, create a standardized protocol to manage severe sepsis that includes the measurement of lactate. Also, it should include a, include a prompt on arterial blood gas questions or physicians order intro to prompt users to order lactate 
or suspect uh, severe sepsis. That particularly applies to large teaching hospitals, particularly when you have residents, uh, just to get them familiar with those, and I think that will uh, work very well. And uh, so with that, uh, I wanted to uh, conclude by saying thank you very much uh, for your attention. And uh, please uh, don't hesitate uh, to send your questions uh, for Q&A. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sayeg. Um, the presentation was very informative. We will now take some time to answer your questions. Uh, if you have a question, please click on the Q&A button and then type in your question and then we'll answer it in the order in which it is received. Right now we have no questions, so uh, Dr. Saig, I, I will ask a question while we wait for um, some questions to come in. Uh, and my question to you is this. Um, uh, lately, procalcitonin has been receiving a lot of attention. Uh, and my question to you is, how will procalcitonin work with lactate uh, in, to improve the management of sepsis in the hospital? Excellent question, uh, Kevin. Uh, as you, you, you know, you may very well know uh, that uh, procalcitonin has been uh, studied for quite some time as well, not as much as uh, lactate with, but it is considered to be a, a, a marker of an early sepsis, the early stages of sepsis. I think that's exciting. I think uh, it will work harmoniously, uh, you know, with lactate level. Uh, I think the approach of biomarker approach, that has been truly um, uh, a blessing uh, with other disease states. You know, you can look at the cardiac aspect of it, uh, you know, using, for example, troponin and BNP and et cetera. I think uh, using a combination of, of biomarkers, particularly, you know, for early and late uh, uh, stages of sepsis uh, to cover and, and uh, and will we'll, uh, we'll ultimately, uh, the outcome is beneficial to our patients. So I see positive impact uh, on utilization of both markers. Good, thank you. So again, if you have a question, um, please click on the Q&A button uh, and type it in and uh, we'll be happy to answer it. wait a few more minutes and um, if we don't have any questions then we'll we'll thank everybody and let them go uh, there there is a question on my side um, uh, Kevin may I read it sure yes uh, he, you mentioned uh, that sepsis is growing problem and the growth is projected to continue what may cause this growing problem uh, you know, I've, I've mentioned earlier, um, you know, uh, the, the contribution of several problems, of growing problems with sepsis. Um, you know, the medical and technological advances uh, definitely are associated uh, with treatment has increased, and so we, we are likelihood of exposure to more pathogen as, a, you know, to enter to uh, the body through via, for example, IVs, uh, certainly a big factor and uh, growing, uh, you know, users of catheters, intravenous lines, and invasive procedures. Um, also, uh, the increasing number of the elderly uh, or debilitating uh, people uh, immunocompromised uh, has, uh, has a lot to do, particularly those patients with cancer. Uh, with, a, with a growing, uh, uh, you know, problem, and and the widespread of using antibiotics. I think those are the three uh, that I mentioned earlier that contributes to the growing problem of sepsis. Okay. So, so I think, um, uh, Dr. Sayeg, I we don't have any questions here. I don't know if you have any more on your end. Um, if there are none, I would like to take this opportunity to um, thank you, Dr. Sayeg, for such an informative presentation. Um, it's a very important topic, uh, and uh, uh, I enjoyed it very much. I'd also like to thank 
our audience for their participation and interest. Um, we have a global audience on the phone with us today, so I'd like to wish everybody a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Gavin, and thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.